So the main thing that you are seeing is the shrinkage in the left side of your memory center. So unfortunately, there's no way to make the shrinkage go away. So I better start prepare myself. <laughs> Can you explain to me under what circumstances uh, will the lasting power of attorney come into force? If my condition gets worse and I cannot manage my own financial affairs and other matters, the two donors will help me to manage. Okay, so your main concern is about your memory loss. Yes. That will require your donors to take control of your welfare. Yes. Yes. Now, at any point in time, if you change your mind, if you feel that you don't want to have an LPA or if you want to change your donors, you have the full authority to do so. All right, uh, last page. Okay, Mr. Yo. Okay. Okay. Like up here, this way. Uh, this document is made. Uh, well, you are still of sound mind, uh, so that if something happens to you and you lost your mental capacity, uh, it can be due to dementia, due to accident, etc. Uh, this document will be used uh, to respect your wishes. La. The advanced care planning is a process of communicating your healthcare preferences, uh, values and decisions to your family members and the healthcare team. Such discussions are normally not done in the family. La. Uh, we seldom think about what should be my care plans, who should care for me, uh, where should I be cared for, etc. If you have dementia or stroke, your family can employ a maid to care for you, your family can uh, hire a private nurse to care for you, or your family members can care for you personally uh, as the caregivers. Or do you want them to send you to a nursing home? Yeah, the first one. First one. That means you prefer to be cared for Domestic house your own because... house. Okay. I'm very happy about the session and I was not expecting so much of uh, details in the advanced care planning document. As I said, it will give the peace of mind to the, the next of kin, the spouse, and uh, th that's very important also the planning of end of life stage. The other one is no funeral rites uh, in the white deck or in the funeral parlour. So do you mean? I mean, we form the mortuary to the <laughs> crematorium. Uh. Oh, I see. That means no funeral, no, no funeral, funeral week, rites, uh, no, no funeral week. Most people, for superstitious reasons or other reasons, normally do not want to plan for it. Uh, all of us will pass away one day. Whether you talk about it or not, it will still happen to us. So it's, it's better to plan in advance uh, in order to let your children know what your wishes are. Uh, then the family won't be at a loss. But I've been dealing with a lot of experts on memory and they tell me there's no medicine or supplement in the world that can reverse your memory. That's true. No, depending on the disease, if it is a pathology, so a disease, there is no cure. And that's what we're working towards. But we're taking a, a different approach into how we want to stop that disease. It's kind of like a cold. So if you have a cold, certain medications you can take to stop a runny nose, right? What we're trying to do is to make the body healthier and stronger so that it can fight the cold. Rather than treat a symptom, we're trying to make the body stronger to fight the disease Resistance. itself. Resistance. Mm -hmm. Resistance, exactly, yeah. Because unfortunately in some dementias and some conditions like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, there's actually cell death. So brain cells are actually dying. And the real sad part about that is in general our brain cells aren't capable of making or regenerating themselves. So unfortunately, sometimes when we diagnose this disease, a lot of the damage has already been done and we can't find a way to reverse that damage because those cells have now gone. So I think the answer to it is to look far earlier and let's try to prevent it from happening or try to push off the age at which we can succumb to these diseases by making our brain stronger. Morning. What do you want? Uh, I'm looking for ginseng. Oh, ginseng. Yeah. Well, we start with ginseng. We have uh, China one. We have sure. the American one. 
and we have the okay. so uh, this is the considered a very good quality because of the uh, age uh, so the price will be different so what we have here is ginseng this is a herb that's been around for a long time so traditionally we know that ginseng is used to help our brain and to help brain health but more specifically we know that clinical trials have shown that it can increase learning and memory, it can increase mental focus, and it can also reduce free radical damage and actually increase certain cellular repair mechanisms within the brain. So what we have here is Gotu Koala, or Centella Asiatica. And actually the traditional story for it is that people notice that elephants love to eat this herb and people associate elephants with intelligence. So they started to eat this herb to help their brain. what happens as we age is there's this balance between repair and ongoing damage. And when we're young, there's lots of repair and relatively little amounts of damage. But as we age, this starts to change. And it hits a point that damage begins to outpace the repair capabilities of our brain. Our brain consists of fats or lipids. And these fats protect our cell and they also help regulate what can come in and out. But what happens as we age is that these fats begin to get damaged by free radicals. And when that damage happens, it can actually disrupt the communication between neurons. So now our neurons are no longer able to communicate properly with one another. And that disruption can interrupt learning, memory, and our ability to form and recall information. So our focus was, let's just try to help the brain and increase its own internal repair capabilities. Our ultimate hope is instead of getting a disease at 75, maybe we can push it to 85 or 90. And actually, as much as 30% of people with no dementia actually have evidence of the amyloid plaques in their brains. And these beta amyloid plaques are actually the cardinal features of people with Alzheimer's disease. So how is it that people have pathology in the amyloid plaques and yet no symptoms or signs of dementia. Could it be that the way then to preventing dementia might be to try to increase cognitive reserve in people because with aging Perhaps it may be very difficult to not um, have any form of pathology in the brain. Given the ravages of time, it might be very difficult to avoid disease. So if there's some disease, is there an equal amount or if not a greater amount of reserve to help to counteract the effects of disease? Then thereby ameliorate or even prevent the symptoms of dementia from emerging. She internalized all that stress and pressure and she developed a lot of tics and physical reactions to her stress. So we play this game, Chinese checkers, with her every day. She likes games which are like puzzle oriented where she has to find combinations. Oh, wow, that's very entertaining. Oh, and you always beat me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Get to again, Grandma. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, she does her word search every day, all day, and usually all night long as well. And in doing that, she has to exercise her mind to find the words that she has been tasked to look for. She goes through several word search books a month. That's her biggest expense, her word search books. 
She's actually very calm now. She doesn't have any of those uh, symptoms that she had before. So she doesn't repeat herself. She doesn't ask questions over and over again. So in many ways, she is much improved from when she came to me before. Cognitive reserve can be built through active use of the brain, through exercise, through uh, active social engagement in life despite one senior years. To, to be able to pursue something meaningful and purposeful in life, all these are ways in which one could build cognitive reserve. doing this work for the past 25 years. Uh, we've conducted many studies, tested many different medications, some of which have been approved for use, but none of the ones that are currently available actually slow the disease course or target the pathology of Alzheimer's. drug gets into the brain, binds to the amyloid plaques, and then it stimulates immune cells to help remove the amyloid plaque. At higher doses, it substantially removes the amyloid from the brain. There appeared to be a slowing down of memory loss in people who got higher doses of the medicine. The whole goal of this type of treatment is to delay the disability of Alzheimer's. That's what people are most afraid of. How are the infusions going? Very well. Yeah, no. Having one today. Okay. But... Hasn't had any reaction to any one of them. Okay, good. Do you think there's been much change in your memory or it's been pretty steady over this past year? I think it's been pretty steady. It, it, it's been pretty steady, yes. Yeah. Uh, the problem's there, but at the same degree that it, it has was. been okay. since the beginning. Alzheimer's is a complex disease, and like other major diseases like heart disease, cancer, HIV, it really requires a combination of treatments. I'm hopeful that this treatment, aducanumab, will be one of the first disease-modifying treatments for Alzheimer's. I think this is the beginning of a breakthrough. It certainly provides hope for both researchers, patients, and families. of the experimental drug that will hopefully eliminate, that would be the first choice, eliminate the amyloid that I have or diminish it or at least that the amyloid plaque would stop growing. So it also could be a placebo, but who knows? I might just get better and better all the time.
having in place is the ability of an elderly person to continue to live in the environment that he or she grew up in, allowing a person to stay and even die in the place that he or she has spent many years uh, familiarizing with. It is a very important concept and to my mind, in terms of uh, long-term care for aging as well as dementia, aging in place is really the most sustainable model compared to institutionalizing uh, such people. Singapore, like most global cities, are not planned for an aging population. Design for dementia was never an important factor when designing cities. We therefore have to invent our own creative solutions within the high-rise, high-density situation. In terms of design, we try to compensate for such disabilities, both in terms of the functional aspect, in terms of the memory aspects, in terms of the cognitive aspect, and also in terms of the psychosocial aspect of a person with dementia. Here we are at the heart of Chongpang, which is a very vibrant area. You can see the community are very active and very lively. The flip side of a very vibrant community is that a dense environment creates a lot of environmental stress, like the kind of noise, the crowding of space. That can sometimes confuse the person with dementia. It is perhaps good if, say, spaces can be a little bit more open, a little bit less crowded. That would help a lot. Right. In a high-rise environment, the design of uh, planning of the lift lobby is very important because navigation is not just on uh, restricted to the horizontal plane, but also in the vertical plane. It is very important that the call buttons are very recognizable to the person with dementia. So in this case, the buttons are actually uh, in numbers. So even the number is not very clearly uh, displayed. If we are able to include some other picture or something like that, that allows the person with dementia to be able to recognize the floor that he or she is living on. And I think these are kind of a very small design measure that can be improved. Another point is that when the person comes out of the lift, the lift landing must be able to allow him or her to recognize on what floor he or she is. So I think in many of these uh, design, the lift landing are very uh, homogeneous, they are quite similar. When you allow people with dementia to wander around, move around, it sort of reduces the instances of challenging behaviour. They are more calm, they are more settled. So in Singapore, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of space to create that kind of wandering place for, for people. But I think we can still be creative, even with a high-rise facility. We can still create safe wandering spaces for people. Lapis, which I used to describe the project, is because I'm layering. I'm layering levels where the family can live, above levels where those with dementia, they can wander about in a safe environment. You will have a link corridor and above it, you have the floors overlooking them. Right. A neighbour who is not having dementia might be looking down on this balcony here and a person with dementia might be just walking around and being lost, this person upstairs can see that person and come down and help them. At the same time, because they're all linked, it's a 100% safe environment because there's no vehicles, there's no cycling here, so the elderly can, can freely move about the space. So it encourages those with dementia to step out of their houses. Well, I think Dawn project is very interesting in his attempt to create a wayfinding system within the high-rise environment. 
And the refinding is important because it allows the person with dementia to come out of his house and wonder about the neighborhood. So I think we have to very quickly find our solutions in terms of design. We are probably about 10 years behind, say, Japan. Uh, and Japan has already faced all the problems that we are likely to face 10 years from now. So we have that head start in a the, in the way uh, and therefore it is important for us to develop our own solutions. Hello. We've all got looking at me. I don't know. No. Oh, oh, it's got bickies. Look, there are a lot of considerations for nursing homes that are working with people living with dementia. The environmental design, the building design, room design, the access to outdoor areas, the wayfinding uh, measures that we have within the facility are very, very important. When a person's dementia has increased at home, they are become a little bit more socially isolated, they are not able to get out into the environment as much as they used to. So when they come into a facility like this, their whole world changes again. It opens up to a range of possibilities that they become curious about. An important feature that we have at Aldinga Beach Court is the wayfinding signs that we have for people living with dementia. Here is a, a sign that indicates all of the houses that we have here and you can see the colour um, identification for each of those houses. Here is the colour striping on each of the rooms. This one, room 8, is what we'd call a, a lime green here. Uh, so this particular resident lives in the blue house in the lime green room. Every uh, client's room has a, um, a memory box that has their special mementos, special things that will help prompt their memory to remind them in addition to the colour on the door that this is their room that they reside in. What we do first is we get, get to know the person, find out their social history and their uh, abilities. And when we know their history, people tend to open up a little bit more. <laughs> we have a lovely lady, she used to run the fire hose out in the war and we found out that her dad was a postman. So now she becomes our post lady. So every night, 4.30, she knows, she gets her bag and she goes and collects the mail and she delivers it all around the facility. We don't let the person fail and um, we can adapt their activities and their roles to suit their next stage. They've got a purpose now and for them, they feel part of this community um, and they actually enjoy working alongside us. <laughs> and because they're doing that and they're remembering how to do some of these tasks and activities, people are feeling better about themselves and uh, their overall sense of well-being has just skyrocketed. In the last three years, I think there is a cultural shift in nursing homes. I think there's a lot of work being done on the ground. People that really care are really trying to push this forward to make sure that the environments are better, more familiar, more comfortable spaces to cater for the people that they're caring for.
we say that aging in place is very important. So if a senior comes in in the early stages of dementia but um, just forgets where he or she puts her keys or forgets how to like come back, you know, but they're physically able, I don't see why they cannot stay in an assisted living facility. We actually even like provide for a small um, kitchenette for them to do some simple cooking. It is their home. So this was um, the concept that we had, um, where their families and friends can actually come and visit as well. When they want to go and have their fish and chips and their beer, I mean, that's available for them. You know, some of them like, like to have their hair coloured. We, we, we do it for them and they want to go to their favourite hairdresser. That's, that's available for them too. So this dignity of care and to enable them to do the things that they have been used to but maybe they can't because they get lost or maybe because families just don't have time to help them do it. We are here to, to keep them happy and to ensure that their dignity is preserved at all times. My sleep apnea started about two to three years ago. Two years ago, I was told to use a CPAP machine. CPAP machine is a, a, a mouthpiece with a small computerized uh, recordings and also for air to be released when I sleep. I find it very, very uncomfortable to use that. But after using it for a couple of weeks, the doctors retrieved the data from this machine and they found that it was good. So I was encouraged to use. We see this area of damage in the left side of the brain. So this tells us that he suffered a stroke and hence his problems with thinking is a direct result of the stroke, what we would describe as post-stroke dementia. In the East, in, in Singapore, for example, more than 80% of our patients have silent strokes together with Alzheimer's disease. Whereas when you compare this to the West, then only about 20 to 30% of their patients with Alzheimer's disease have silent strokes. In a recent publication that we published about two years ago, we showed that in the mild Alzheimer's disease group, 30% of our patients have severe a very high load of silent strokes in the brain. So much so that when you do a scan, what you mainly see is only silent strokes. And then when you look harder, that's then uh, when you see more of the Alzheimer's disease changes. So it's something that we cannot just ignore. We know that it is small vessels. The small vessels are the, are the culprits why we have the silent strokes. And other than lifestyle measures, things like high blood pressure, which is I think highly prevalent and not well controlled in this part of the world, there may also be genetic factors. So that is where our research is focused on looking at how intervention uh, with antihypertensive treatment, uh, lifestyle changes, or genetic measures can make a difference in terms of the silent strokes in the brain. There's no cure for dementia, but we know the risk factors. If we can attack the risk factors, then the chances of developing dementia will be much lower. So we reckon from the Jurong Indian study, we started a program 
we probably cannot uh, prevent all dementias, even reduce the prevalence by 10%. That is tremendous. 10% is about 2,000 cases in Singapore. One group will be doing Tai Chi, one to do mindfulness and meditation, another group on art therapy, another group on music and reminiscence. And we were surprised that after three months, you know, all of them improved you know, in terms of their depression. The people in the music group improved faster. And then after a year, we found that 20% of this group of people, the whole group of them, the memory improved 20%. Mindfulness is a practice, it's a way of being. It's about paying attention in the present moment. What normally our minds do is that we're 10 steps ahead thinking about the future, or we're lingering in the past and we're not really showing up for our lives. And this can have an enormous impact on our relationships, on our mental health, on our physical well-being. Uh In the beginning, there were a lot of questions. They don't know how to begin. They haven't encountered this type of meditation before. They find it very difficult to come to meditation stage. So we measure improvement by using uh, questionnaires and uh, standard assessment tools and we look at their uh, symptoms such as uh, stress, uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms, uh, their cognitive function. We also use brain scans at the baseline and after the mindfulness practice duration to see if there are any changes. So this is a participant in our study. Today we're doing a first baseline scan, making sure that uh, the brain looks okay. Once this is done, we'll analyze it further. We're looking at how well the brain is connected, one region uh, with another region, one area to another. Generally, the better connected the brain is, the more uh, healthy uh, the brain will be. As we start to exercise the mind to pay more attention, we are significantly impacting the brain. Research studies have shown with MRIs and EEGs that those who have an established long-term mindfulness practice actually have more grey matter in the front part of the brain. And that's where decision-making happens, that's where empathy, morality, memory, concentration all take place. And so it really doesn't matter at what point we start. Of course, the sooner the better, but if you're already 75 years old, why not start today? Okay. You have to loosen the heart. And then... There's a lot of fear about, about dementia, a lot of misconception. So we first tell the, the family that dementia is not a terminal illness, that you're not going to die in three or four or five years. It's, it's a chronic illness. And there are many things you can do to improve the quality of life of the dementia elderly.
Yes, actually in our own study, about 50% of our families actually tap on the services of foreign domestic workers to care for their loved ones with dementia. So foreign domestic workers certainly play an intimate role in the care of older people with dementia. However, unfortunately, there's perhaps at this point in time not adequate support for them by way of practical support and also emotional support. And if they run into problems, who can they actually turn to? Is there a helpline for them? So you feel that the task is actually right. Sometimes you ask them to do that and you don't know what's the instruction. So the instruction must be have to be cleared. So you also don't understand and then sometimes you miss out. So it's important that when you Many of the foreign domestic workers do not speak the dialects or the language of the person they are caring for. So in dementia care, communication is the most fundamental issue. You cannot communicate well with the person with dementia. You cannot develop a, a good relationship with the person. Maybe roughly, you already have a schedule for your papa, right? Do you feel that it works for your papa and your papa can sleep good oh, at night? Yes. yes. We go, we do shopping, we eat. Dinner outside, we spend until 9 o'clock. Each time when there's something come up at home, you know, the domestic helper will just call the family and say, Hey, I have this problem, can you come and help? You know, I, I don't know what to do. You know, uh, Ama is so angry suddenly, I don't know what to do. So, hoping after the training, they bring back the practical tips that they have learned in the classroom and to apply it at home. A lot of times, the feedback I've gotten from them is that they have now become more patient. They uh, understand uh, what the person with dementia is going through. They can handle the situation at home and they feel that they are not alone in this journey. some research on the impact of social isolation or loneliness on older adults' health. And what we found was actually quite striking. Older adults who are lonely are much more likely to die over a four-year period compared to older adults who report not being lonely. The Singapore environment is highly urban. For older people who have a slight bit of cognitive impairment or maybe some beginning signs of disability, maybe less willing to go out into the environment and therefore their level of social integration goes down. Um, what follows then are, are these feelings of loneliness. Looking at the way our society is evolving, when families are small and they're nuclear and money are dual income and there are more and more older people who are staying on their own. Some don't even have children. So when they one day become frail and in need of help for their daily living, who is going to provide that help for them? blocks to go house to house, inviting people who are poor and living alone to come down to the senior activity centers to participate in activities daily, such as exercise, bingo, karaoke, and so on. They feel that nobody cares for them anymore. And because they are alone, they don't bother to go out. And the befrienders, therefore, take it upon themselves to reach out to them, uh, speak with them, make them feel that they are still a part of society. <laughs> and we find that this helped to push back dementia. No, 
有听过这个失智症？有了报纸，整天都有的，所以我就是每天买一份报纸回来看。就是有，我也好像也是有捡一些那些老老人家，因为我去拿饭的时候，那个安迪也是了，明明看他很好嘞，他好像看那很，他拿了饭了，等一下不会回家嘞。他问我们他家在哪里哦，所以你你会自己会怕了。万一个人回来，要是有这生病哦，你就会怕了。试试看这边，按在你这边，两肩，按得到吗？哦、按到这个洞吗？这边哦，现在人痛心，人一点痛，一定要痛的，没有痛就。When I first came, her life wasn't as good as now. Emotionally, you know, very unstable a bit. And then every time when she touches any topics or matters you know, about her family, start to cry and things like that. She don't really have anyone to talk to. Ever since I been assigned to her, she knows that there's somebody that she can rely on, somebody she can trust with her secrets and all her, her things. Hey, you come here, see, is it dark? Dark? No, if it's dark, you will see that dark. When the light comes, what kind of things he will share with you? Find that kind of thing is good. 希望就是你们有心有时候来看看我，他没有什么希望。Thank you. I got something to tell you. If you see Uncle Tan around here, ha, make sure you tell him which floor he stay. Okay? I will. I promise you. Bye bye. Forget us not campaign essentially aims to make our society and community more elder and dementia friendly. There are many people with dementia moving around in public spaces and there will be more to come. They might run into problems like getting lost or walking out of the shop without paying for their purchase. So it's to help them understand that these are people with needs and know how to help them. Hello, how are you? Okay. You are very important. You actually played the eyes and the ears for the police. If you know that that person has dementia, you know how to react already when you approach, when you talk to the person you kind of know what is going on. See, help and share. If you see a person with dementia, offer some help, a person in need. Now the fear is that people with dementia, they are afraid to leave the house and the caregivers feel ashamed that they keep them in the house, then they deteriorate faster. They're able to come out, the community accept them, they visit public places and people know who they are, then we can take care of them better because all of us are at risk of dementia. We should be able to respect them because we could be the victims of our own prejudice. I am quite an optimistic person. I don't think I am going to be sad about what has happened or what is going to come. Just live life as it is, one day at a time. I think the central message for family carers and for people with dementia is to be strong. Never to take no for an answer. If they're told that they haven't got dementia, to get a second opinion if they know something is wrong. And to seek support from Alzheimer's organisations or to try another service. To really fight for access to what they have a right to. I realise that I'm not alone. There's a lot of other people in Singapore that faces the same problem or sometimes worse scenario than my mum's condition. So, make me f don't feel so bad after all. If dementia is a condition that atrophies the brain, 
then shouldn't we look at how we can get people to have a healthy brain and have preventative measures even for kids to understand what it takes to have a, a lifestyle that gives you a healthy brain. And if kids understand what dementia is, what a healthy brain is, they can actually promote these aspects to the different generations. Dementia used to be considered an old age disease, but today actually dementia is affecting people in their 50s and sometimes even in their 40s. So people need to think that this is not something that won't affect you. People don't start getting educated until it starts happening to them. And one thing that people need to know is that it might not happen to you or it might not happen to your own loved one, but it will happen to someone around you. We've come a long way, but I think a lot still needs to be done to make Singapore a dementia-friendly community.